So hi everyone, welcome to today's six research seminar. Um, I'm hosting on behalf of the school's uh, research committee and, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'll begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri, Ngunnawal, Gundagara and Birupai peoples of Australia who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located uh, and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Um, so as I mentioned, this uh, session is being recorded. Um, if there are people here from outside the school, it would be great if you could say hello in the chat and let us know where you're we're coming in from, because we do like to keep uh, keep track of, um, of of attendees at these um, sessions. Uh, the usual format, so there'll be around 40 minutes of uh, presentation from Jane um, and then plenty of time after that for questions. Um, you can put your questions in the chat or I'm sure Jane is happy for you to put mics and cameras on and ask questions uh, at the end. Um, so today's seminar is titled Taking Chapman Back to Prison, Rethinking the Theory of Life in the Round. And our presenter, of course, is Dr. Jane Garner. Uh, and for the next two days, Jane is a lecturer in the School of uh, Information and Communication Studies after which she will be a senior lecturer in the School of Information and Communication Studies. You should have timed it a bit better, Jane, and <laughs> got the full intro. Uh, and of course, she's also a DECRA fellow. Um, Jane received a PhD from RMIT in 2017, um, so almost at the end of your ECR period, which is notable because, of course, today it was announced that Jane uh, was the faculty winner and overall joint winner uh, of the university's excellence as an early career researcher award so congratulations Thank to you. Jane um, sets a high bar for this presentation doesn't it to, to, to actually have to present research on the day you win this award um, her research interests include the role of books libraries reading and information in the lives of people experiencing disadvantage and poverty so without further ado I will hand over to you Jane thank you Simon so I'm going to try and share my screen always a bit of a gamble. I reckon that's going to do it. Does that look like you can see my big, the whole screen? Yeah, excellent. Beautiful, beautiful. <clears throat> okay, let me see if I can get my, all right, that's what I want. Perfect. Okay. So yes, they, um, this presentation is called <coughs> Taking Chapman Back to Prison, Rethinking Theory of Life in the Round. And that photo is a photo I took um, from the library at Bathurst, no, at Silverwater Women's Prison in New South Wales. Uh, so before I start, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Abbotsford in Melbourne. So it's the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners of this beautiful part of Victoria. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and elders of other communities who may be here today. So this presentation is um, highly theoretical. Um, so it is going to be somewhat dry um, but I hope it will be of, of interest to you and I'm really pleased that I'm getting the chance to critique a theory an information studies theory with a whole bunch of information studies academics because and others of interested people uh, because um, it is a theory that is held tightly but not one that I can agree with so I'm really keen to hear what you all think about it. So this is the lady who wrote the theory uh, that I'm working with. Uh, this is Dr. Elfrida Chapman. She uh, was an American woman who was born 1942, died 2002. So she didn't grow old. She died at, when she was about 60. Um, she had been a nun and she'd also been an academic in information studies schools at a couple of different universities through uh, in America. Now she wrote this theory uh, called life in the round and also uh, this is an article that was written by Kim Thompson who from who used to be in our school I'm sure most of you know her and she wrote this article about Chapman's theory building processes so if you're interested in how Chapman came to build her theories then this is a really nice article to read and you can scan that QR code to take you to that article so if you're interested in how Chapman built her theories, this is a really nice one to have a look at. 
This is the theory itself that I've been working with. So this is her theory of life in the round. She wrote this in 1999, so just a couple of years before she died. And she um, didn't give a lot away about how she came to build her theory. The only thing that we really know is that she based it in from field work in three different environments. The first one being a prison. The second one was, actually the first one was a retirement village and the second one was a prison. And then a third one was a group of cleaners from uh, like industrial commercial cleaners who worked together on the one site. So when it came to building her theory, she, as I said, she didn't give a lot away about her methodologies. All we really know, particularly with the prison element of the theory building is that she created ethnographic research and interviews with 80 women at the prison. So this is a quote from her article. She went to a maximum security prison for women. And but we don't know how long she spent in there, whether it was like a one day or two days or whether she spent a whole lot of time there. Um, ethnographic suggests that she spent quite a lot of time there, but she didn't actually document her processes that she went through to or her methodology that she used to build her theory but she did come up with this idea of life lived in the round so this is a, a life that she described which is um, all of these elements of sort of imprecision and uncertainty it's a very public form of life certain things are in, implicitly understood by the group of people who live in this community and they have um, a set of sort of norms and behaviours that uh, belong to that group. Now, she borrowed these ideas from a lady called Benita Luckman, who was writing in the 1970s. And she was a social science researcher too. And she came up with this idea of a small world. And the idea of the small world being that people have shared beliefs, they, um, agree with each other on their sort of idea of their worldview and their values and that sort of thing. Uh, so Chapman took this idea and sort of expanded it a little bit and came up with this idea that the activities in this small world are routine and predictable. They, uh, the people are bound together by social controls and customs and behaviours and a worldview. So when I'm trying to get my head around this idea, I think of like one of those um, maybe back in time, a little village on the top of a mountain in Italy somewhere where people don't mix a lot with the outside world. It's a very insular place where there are shared worldviews and shared knowledge and shared values. That's sort of how I think about this idea of a small world. And you can sort of see how that could translate to a prison because, again, it's really isolated. Everybody lives in each other's faces. It's all very public and um, you tend to have shared views and values because if they differ then that could be uh, that could compromise your safety so she described this idea of this life in the round when she started then looking at okay how does information work in these places so if you think you're like you know the little village on top of the mountain how does information work in a place like that and she had six propositions that she used to describe how information would work in a little place, a small world like that. So she had this idea that there were like insiders and outsiders. And again, she borrowed on some other theories for this sort of insider outsider theory. And she was saying that's the insiders. So the people who are really enculturated into that small world who set the boundaries of behavior, who say, you know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what's right and what's wrong and how far you can deviate from that before you're sort of crossing boundaries. She said that um, people's behavior, including information seeking behavior is really publicly scrutinized. So everybody knows each other's business. Everyone knows what everyone else is doing. And that has a, a it's one of the influencing factors on how people behave. And she said, through establishing an appropriate behavior, a worldview is created. So again, this whole idea of having to conform to fit in. Um, if you don't conform, if you start having behaviors or thoughts or ideas or values that don't conform with the small world, then you start getting pushed out and you start being one of these sort of outsiders. And it also works the other way when somebody might come into that small world from somewhere else, 
they eventually become enculturated into that small world and they start to have shared beliefs and shared values and start using the same language, same sort of, you know, even sort of things like slang and terminology that people use within that world. That happens over time as people, new people come in, they start to sort of get pulled into that culture um, so they can feel like an insider, otherwise they're forever the, uh, the outsider in the group, which is not a comfortable place to be. So they're the first three propositions that she uses to talk about information use or information behaviours in a small world. Then she moved on to four, five and six. Now at four, she says that life lived in the round, most of the time it works okay. Most of the time it's, it's predictable enough that nothing really different happens. But she says, if there's a, unless there's a critical problem, there's no point in seeking information at all. So her theory was that unless something disastrous happens and there's a real critical incident, then there's no point in looking for information because everything you need is already understood and known within that small world. So there's, there's no need to sort of start looking outside the small world unless something has gone really, really horribly wrong. And she said members, number five, members who live in the round will not cross the boundaries of their world to seek information. So she's saying people who live like this won't go outside their world to find information about anything because everything they need is there in that small world and their shared beliefs and values and their knowledge of that world is sufficient to enable them not to have to go outside that world for information. But then she started thinking, well, actually, that's not always true. So she popped in Proposition 6 and Proposition 6 says that they will go outside the boundaries of that small world if there are three conditions that are met in tandem. And she's used the word and in between two and three, which suggests to me that all three have to exist in the, it, at the same time. So she's saying people will go outside that small world for information if the information is perceived as critical, if there's a collective expectation that that information is going to be relevant, and there's a perception that their life that they're living in the information world that they're working in is no longer functioning sufficiently for them. So that's the idea. So that's her theory. If people will live in these small worlds who live in small worlds won't go outside that small world to find information because they just don't need it unless there's a critical issue there's a collective expectation that this information that they're going to seek from outside that world is going to be relevant to the collective and that the information world that they've been living in is no longer sufficiently functional. So when I was doing my research for my PhD, I was spending a lot of time in prisons talking to prisoners about their information needs and about their libraries and how they use them, what sort of information they would like to have that they can't get hold of. And I met this uh, man who was in a prison in South Australia and he, he was, had been convicted of murder and he was not going to leave prison. He would die in prison because of the nature of his crime. It was a very public and uh, violent uh, crime that he committed. And he said, uh, I said to him, you know, what would you want if your library could have anything? What information do you want to have that you haven't got? And he said, you know, what I'd really want to know is how do yachts sail into the wind and make progress? What's the physics of a yacht that enables it to go into the wind and still make progress? And at, sort of, at the time I was sort of reading Chapman's work and I started thinking about this guy and thinking, well, he's, the information he wants is, is not really what I'm thinking would, she would say would be needed in a small world even though she built her theory in a prison. And here's this prisoner telling me something completely different. So then I started going back to the rest of my data and looking at it again. And I was seeing evidence of prisoners all over the place saying things like similar to this, what's the physics of a yacht? Um, there was one guy who wanted to know how a, um, you know, solar panels on your roof work. There was another guy who wanted to know the nutritional status of strawberries that have been grown hydroponically versus those grown in dirt. And you know, there was all these there is evidence of these really sort of wacky, interesting things that prisoners wanted to know. So then I started looking at that against Chapman's sixth proposition and saying, okay, well, do these interests 
fit that sixth proposition that would then allow me to say that whole her small world theory is supported by what I'm hearing from prisoners. And so I started to think, well, is it critical to this man to know how to sail a yacht or the physics of yachting? No, clearly it's not because he's not ever going to go near a body of water again. Um, is there a collective expectation that information is relevant? Again, it cannot possibly be demonstrated that to understand the physics of a yacht would be relevant to someone living in a prison. And then the idea that life lived in the round is no longer functioning is something that I'll, I'll deal with later, but it's uh, basically that prisons are not information worlds that are functioning well. So I had this idea in the back of my head for years, right? Like this theory is, is not not supportable from what I'm hearing. I would really love to test it properly because I didn't mean to test that theory. It just came up in the work that I was doing. So then I was really fortunate and I was granted an ECR grant from CSU, which enabled me to do a study of prisoner information behaviours, prisoner information seeking and behaviours. So that took me into six prisons across New South Wales. So we've got the top corner there is Long Bay Jail. Then um, in the middle on the top is Dilwinia Women's, which is out in Windsor. Uh, so Long Bay is down sort of near the airport in New South Wales. Um, Dilwinia Women's is out in Windsor. Um, the one at the top right is uh, Silverwater Women's, um, which is uh, sort of out past can't remember, Parramatta somewhere. Mary Wade is the bottom left-hand corner. That's a men's prison um, for uh, low security prisoners. The guys there actually go out during the day and go to work. Um, half of the prisoners can do that. The other half are on terrorism sentences and they don't leave. Um, down the bottom in the middle is the Mid-North Coast Correctional Centre near our Port Macquarie campus. And then bottom right is the Bathurst Correctional Centre. So I spent um, three days in Long Bay and a single day in each of the other prisons talking to prisoners um, about their information needs and their information behaviours. So the broader study looked at what their information needs were against these six information areas there on the left. And then I looked at which information sources they were using to try and meet the needs against each of those six information areas. And those sources are listed on the right. <coughs> and they're all sources that are available to, to prisoners. And this is what I found. Um, so I was, this, this again is the breakdown of where I went. So uh, at each prison, I gave prisoners um, surveys, so they were given to them before I got there, and then they were returned to me. And while I was in the prisons, I got to interview 27 prisoners across each of the, across the whole set of the six prisons. So 106 uh, surveys came back and then I had 27 interviews. There was meant to be four interviews at each place, but um, at this particular prison, which was uh, at Long Bay, word got out that I was doing this research and the men who were in there were really keen to have their stories told. So um, they started to say, can you please interview me too? So I ended up getting seven uh, interviews at that particular place. So at each of these, so this, I used this data to help me understand where they were going to find their information. And I also asked quite a, specific question that would allow me to test Chapman's theory while I was doing this work. And that was, I asked this to each of the 27 interviewees, while you're living here, are you interested in information about what's happening in the outside world? Or do you focus your attention on the information you need to live this period of your life in here? So that was specifically designed to test this idea of like, are you going outside your small world to find information or are you finding everything you need? And are you not interested in what's going on in outside that small world? And this is what I found. I hope you can read that. It's a little bit small, isn't it? But the um, what this is showing is how many people have an information need uh, from against each of those six information areas and then whether they're satisfying or trying to satisfy those information needs from sources that are within the prison or sources that are outside the prison. So sources within the prison are the prison library, some of them have a tablet device, 
other inmates and custodial staff and sources that are external to the small world of the prison, our families and friends, television and radio and others, which was um, in every case, it was legal, either, either legal aid or private legal practitioners and health practitioners as well. So you can see from this that against each of those six information areas, legal, education, spirituality, health, prison life and reintegration, every single time, every single information type had people looking outside the small world for information about that. So um, the highest one there was reintegration information. So 26.1% of information seeking about reintegration after you know, the end of the sentence, but we're getting back into the community um, was sought from sources outside the small world. The smallest one there was all this equal one, spirituality and prison life that we had fewer people looking outside this, their small world of the prison to satisfy their information needs. Spirituality, because the New South Wales prisons have a chaplaincy service, where there's a chaplain who comes into the prison every day or a couple of times a week, and they were therefore satisfying their information needs about spirituality really easily from within the prison. And prison life, again, it was, uh, prisoners talking to prisoners about, you know, when's buy up, how do I do my washing, um, where do I, how do I use the telephones, all that stuff, it makes sense that that was satisfied from within the prison. So looking at that last column there, we can see that there is uh, evidence of people looking outside the small world to satisfy their information needs. So that in my mind deals with proposition five members who live in the round will not cross boundaries of their information world to seek information. I have, my data suggests that that is that I can't support that. My data doesn't support that proposition. So that moves on to proposition six. So just as a reminder, proposition six is that will they proposition five doesn't hold up if the information that they want is critical, there's a collective expectation that it's going to be relevant and that the life in the round is no longer functioning. So I'm going to look at each of those three and um, see how my data stacks up against them. So the first one there that the information perceived is critical. So they're saying this is saying, okay, we're not going to look outside our small world for information unless it's really critical to us. And I think it's fair to say that it, the information about legal matters, health, education, spirituality, prison life and reintegration is critical to people in prison. So it is obvious, I think, that that sort of information would be critical. But the, uh, they're also, the prisons are also telling me that they are interested in, world, in information outside their small world that is um, not related to those critical things. So there's some quotes there from some of the people I spoke to. Um, there's one guy here at the top who uh, used to subscribe to the New Yorker, Scientific American and a few other magazines and he wasn't allowed to do that anymore. Um, so now he was he was told he could only subscribe to one magazine so he chose Science Illustrated and his friends send him in information from outside if anything interesting happens. Uh, another one down here <coughs> Uh, saying yes that we're interested in the world outside and someone down the bottom there saying that they tap into the ABC News and the BBC News every day to keep in touch and some of the prisoners were saying you know we've got more time here than we do on the outside so when we're here we, we are more interested and engaged with what's going on outside because we'd have time to do that. So the argument here is that this information is not critical to them and yet they're still going outside their small world to find it. So the idea that you'll only go outside your small world if the information is critical isn't supported by this data. The second element of Proposition 6 is that there's a collective expectation that the information is relevant. So you will go outside your small world for information if there's a collective expectation that, it, that the information is relevant. Now, she doesn't actually... Chapman never actually sort of explained what she meant by a collective expectation, but I think what she was saying is that members of the group all agree 
that this is going to be relevant. And she's changed the language here. She's no longer talking about information being critical. She's now talking about information being relevant. And uh, so in terms of this study, I think the collective could be defined in different ways. It could be the collective of the prison as a whole. It could be a, the collective of the people who live on the same cell block or it could be the, the collective of people who live in the same cell because very few prisons have single people in cells anymore. So whichever way you take it, I think there's evidence to suggest that the collective expectation uh, isn't relevant when people are looking to the outside world for information. So there's two quotes here from some of the prisoners I spoke to. Um, this person at the top, saying you know we're interested in the world we want to know what's going on in the war in Iraq we want to know what's this thing monkeypox what is that all about um, and they talk about it amongst themselves so there's no way that the war in Iraq could be of collective relevance to prisoners locked up in New South Wales jails and yet they're still interested they're still seeking information about that this fellow down the bottom his sister lives in France so she sends him a whole lot of information about life in Europe life in France so again, it's hard to demonstrate that life in France is collectively relevant to people in New South Wales prisons, and yet they're still seeking information about that. So I think element two can't really be supported by my data. And that takes us to element three, <coughs> which is saying that we will go outside our small world to look for information if the information world that we're living in is no longer functioning. And this language of no longer functioning suggests to me that there has been a time when it has functioned and it's no longer functioning. And so now we have to look outside for information. And when she was describing the prison that she did her research in, she said she expected to find information poverty in the prison, but she was surprised because she went into this prison and she found what she described as an information world that was functioning quite well. So I can't imagine how that could be. I've been to 17 prisons across three countries, across multiple years, and um, I've got a couple of pictures of what the information worlds that I see when I'm in there. Um, these are from my recent study. So this is, these are the sites that this data has come from. And you can see the collections are terrible. Um, they're sometimes very neat because the prisoners have a long time and a lot of time to organise themselves, uh, but they, the collections are terrible. So this is on the right hand side, there is a non-fiction collection in one of the prisons. You can see you've got the World Book Encyclopedia up there. Um, we've got some reading sets of things, but generally it's very, very poor. This was another of the prisons I went to. This was the entire library um, for about maybe 250, 300 men. Um, this was their barbecue. And uh, this was in one of the women's prisons and that was their library that they were given access to. So um, these are, I've chosen sort of the worst photos in a way, but there are other photos I could show you that have very neat libraries, but not collections that are, we're going to be providing an information world that is functioning well. And uh, when I was looking at their information needs and what percentage of those needs were not being met at all, this is the figure on this right hand side here. So I can see like 29% of legal information needs were unmet and 29.7% of health needs were unmet. So that's a lot of unanswered questions. That's a, not evidence of an information world that's working well. So I find it hard to imagine any information world that we could use to support up element three of proposition six to say that it is no longer functioning because I don't think they've ever functioned well enough to be sufficient to meet information needs. And if we remember that Proposition 6 used the word and, so that suggests to me that all of these three elements have to coexist in tandem, where the they'll only go outside their information world, they'll only go outside their small world for information if it's perceived as critical, and there is an expectation 
that it is relevant to the collective and the information world has stopped functioning well. So on the basis of that, I can't find data that supports Proposition 6 at all. I also can't find data that supports Proposition 5, that members will not cross outside the boundaries of their world to seek information, because they clearly do, which then undoes Proposition 4, which says that unless a critical problem arises, there's no point in seeking information. Clearly, my uh, data is saying that people will look outside their small world of a prison for information, regardless of its critical or relevant nature, or regardless of any change in the information functioning, the functioning of the information world. But, there's always a but. The, the theory that Chapman put together, uh, she published it in 1999, so that's 23 years ago. So it is possible that there are reasons why what worked for her, what she found observable and managed to build a theory from is no longer current or no longer applicable. Um, maybe we're more curious than we used to be. Maybe prisoners are going into jail now and instead of being happy with focusing on their small world, maybe they're so used to having the internet that they are now more demanding or have higher expectations of being able to engage with information. Don't know. Um, Chapman's prisoners were all American. Maybe Australians are more curious. I doubt it somehow. Um, she worked with only women and only uh, maximum security prisoners. I have data from women in maximum security prisons, which is um, consistent with the whole body of data that I've been working with. And there's no statistical significance in uh, or difference in either across genders or across security levels. Um, the only difference really that was, well, it was easy to see there was the spirituality related information where women were much more likely to look for spirituality related information than men were. Um, so, um, I can't say that I, my data can support Chapman's theory. So I think it will be really, really interesting to try to test her theory in other areas that she built her theory from. So go back to a, um, a retirement village or go back to a community of um, manual workers who don't. But it'd be really hard to do because like, if you go into a retirement village, they're very likely to have access to the internet on their phones or something. So it would be really hard to replicate her study somewhere else or to even test her study in one of those sort of environments. It worked in a prison because the, the conditions or the information world is pretty much the same from when she wrote her work to when I did my work. So it was quite easy to, to sort of you know, test her work there. There's been a couple of articles that have um, well, there's actually quite a few articles that apply her theory to different small worlds to see if it works. Um, like this is top one there, Dan Kassa. He wrote, I think it's a he, they wrote a, uh, yeah, they looked at her theory against the information behaviours of Catholic clergy in northern Nigeria. And then the bottom one there, Zhu and Lao, they studied the information behaviours of ethnic minorities in China and they used Chapman to try and explain what they saw. But again, they didn't um, challenge her theory. All they did was look at their data and say, okay, this fits with what Chapman said. Or well, they used Chapman to try and explain what they were seeing rather than actually digging into the theory and taking it for a walk and saying, okay, does this actually hold up? Um, which is what I've been trying to do. So I've written all this up and it's going to be published in Journal of Documentation next year. It's just been accepted for publication. Um, so if you're really, really keen and you want to hear more, um, you can read about that there. And that's it for me. That's a beautiful, uh, sandstone lion which sits on the top of the um, old gate into Bathurst prison and he has a brass key in his mouth which just proves that you got absolutely no chance of cracking out of there because the lion's got the key. So thank you very much. Uh, for any questions I'd love to hear what you think.
Thanks, Jane. There was a question from Hamid in the chat. Um, I'm wondering if Chapman asked such open questions or limited the questions, like what is it you want to know for your life in prison or something? Yeah, I wish I knew Hamid. Like she didn't she didn't write down her methodology at all. All, all we know is that she gathered ethnographic data from 80 women in a maximum security prison in uh, North Carolina. That's all we know. It's um, she just never wrote a methodology down. So don't know. Be good to know. Jay, I can see you've got a hand up there. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Jane. I really, um, really appreciate interesting research like this that's sort of asking different questions of different spaces. Um, my question is around uh, the definition and the purpose of small worlds for individuals in collectives within those worlds. So do you think there's any um, distinctions to be made about information seeking of prisoners inside a small world that they did not choose to actually become a, a part of a collective in? Um, and whether you know the information that you say it seems logical for them to seek is available within the walls of prison, for example, legal health, um, what was the other uh, spirituality? So those kind of um, less tangible, I think, or not less tangible, those um, dominating needs for survival are met within the uh, small world of the prison. However, the connection to the outside world, which may be in some way their predominant connection, Whereas, you know, they don't have a choice whether to go and enter and be part of the small world of the prison. They've come from a small world outside uh, that belongs in a bigger world that they have to some extent chosen to be part of a collective in. How, how did you position that kind of uh, element of choice, um, being forced into small worlds, being forced to adopt particular norms inside a captive space um, in relation to information seeking? Yeah, great question, Jay. Thank you. Um, I think I didn't set out to address that at all. Um, the sort of work I like to do is just to let people tell me their stories rather than me trying to um, test particular, uh, like trying to impose my understanding of what their life might be like outside or inside. Um, I think the uh, maybe the thing that I observed that might be relevant is that uh, when people come into prison, they are often it's, it's often not their first time in, and they are quite happily not happily, but they're it's not always a difficult transition. Some of them say, "Oh, yep, yeah, I've." back here this is just part of my existence I'm in and I'm out and when I'm out I do this when I'm in I do that and they have different information seeking behaviors based on that I think um, when they first come in particularly if they've not been in prison before their information focus is more strongly on the outside world and then there is a process of enculturation as they get more um, sort of assimilated, I suppose, into that closed community of the prison where they have to start making choices about where they, whether they keep their, you know, one foot in both worlds or whether they try and um, bring themselves into the prison just to try and live there and try and survive it. And it's different for different genders. Um, women will often keep a foot in the outside world and whereas the men won't because often it's the women who have got children that they're caring for and you know, needing to keep track of or children with relatives or they've gone into care or whatever. Um, um, but then equally, a lot of women will say, I can't hear about the outside world because it hurts too much. I can't think about my children. I can't think about my family because it's just too hard. It hurts too much. Um, men are more likely to say things like, um, I don't want to think about my family because I can't control what's going on out there. So it's not so much an emotional issue, it's more of a control issue. Um, I think moving from a world of choice into a world of no choice is never going to be easy. But for a lot of people, it's a familiar space. 
and perhaps that helps them with the way they deal with information. They don't, their information needs differ based on their experience in those sort of small worlds. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I hope that's helpful. Is Jane Yazdan. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jane, for this interesting and informative uh, presentation. Uh, in one of your slides, you addressed uh, the possibility of the differences. I have a comment that you can think about. I think one of the explanation is, um, you know, Chatman theory represents the dominant paradigm of that time that we always, for several decades, we thought that we seek information only when we have a problem to solve. But now, after several decades, we are thinking not necessarily. The, what I'm doing in my research, the joy of information, my research also shows that people look for information not to solve a problem because they are just interested. Like the prisoner that's asked, uh, when you ask him, what do you really need to know? And he said, what is the science behind that vote, you know? Because, because in his situation, what is critical? He's there for life. So he has a transcendental view about life now. So now he really is interested in things that may be not interesting for many people. So the concept of critical is very different for that person now. So, so basically to summarize what I'm, trying to say is when we develop a theory, unconsciously we reproduce the paradigm of our field with the paradigm of our scholarship. We used to think that just many other disciplines, we used to think that we are seeking information to fix a problem, but that's not the entire story. It's not the whole story. Most of the time we seek information to satisfy our curiosity because we enjoy seeking that. So, so that's my comment about, and this is one, one of the possibilities. And uh, obviously Chatman's uh, theory is contextual and uh, that the concept of, you know, uh, that she addresses is different. So that was my, my comment, thank you. Yeah, I think you, you're definitely onto something there. And that was um, when I put the article through to journal documentation that was what one of the reviewers said too was like you know maybe their expectations are different um and that can happen because you know over time this is like 20 years have passed and we think about information differently we have our levels of information is not just about trying to solve a critical problem it can be about being yeah just interested in something and also you're right like this that particular guy he um he went into jail as a sort of you know youngish man in his 30s and he was never going to leave so yes he his idea of what's critical he would have dealt with really early on like okay I know when I can do buy up I know how to wash my clothes I know how often I'm allowed out of my cell and so all that sort of you know, that critical stuff gets done and dealt with and then you're right they have time to sit and mull and think about things and maybe that's when curiosity sparks off yeah. other ideas that they might then be interested in yeah, and also uh, for the concept of a small world, you in your research, you can look at it. The concept of a small world is different now. For example, in social media, we all live in a small worlds now. The people that we accept as friends, the people we follow, we, it, cre it creates a small virtual small world for us. So that's another issue you can think of. Thank you. Thank you, Yasta. Uh, do Jane. we have some time or do we are we up, up? No, we have we have time. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Go for it, Wasim. So um, uh, thanks, uh, Jane. Uh, first of all, some, some comments. I think that in order to uh, uh, look at the, some of the propositions uh, and in order to see whether the propositions hold also still today, I think it will be important to look at, for example, what kind of level of analysis that Chapman did like whether she aggregated what at what level she aggregated her data obviously Hamid already raised a question about what kinds of questions she asked you know so i think unless we know those kind of details uh, you know it will be hard to actually 
justify with the current existing like data sets, you know, in order to demonstrate whether the propositions from that time hold or not. But having said that, um, there can be some avenues to look at. I don't know whether it is possible or not. For example, um, in the state of Ohio and the state of Pennsylvania, like Amish communities. Some of the Amish communities, they are still very, you know, living in this, like in a very small world. And perhaps, you know, <laughs> you know, you never know, maybe you will get an opportunity to test the theory, uh, you know, in that um, kind of an environment. The second, I think, avenue can be the communities which are um, um, in online spaces, but they are representing extremes. Um, um, like a lot of far right communities, you know, um, online communities I'm talking about, um, you can test this kind of, uh, you know, theory with them, obviously from a different perspective, but maybe there will be an opportunity to test that, you know, that because they are highly, uh, I would say, sensitive to any information which is against their beliefs and, and, and you know, against their views, actually. So they reject outright anything outside of that information, you know, environment, uh, a cocoon, I would say, you know. So it is um, just these uh, some few thoughts and thanks again. Yeah, that would be amazing. Imagine having to choose between the Amish and the extremists. I'm like, I think I think I'd be getting my horse and buggy, but um, <laughs> I think you're right. It's very difficult to test her theory with any sort of great surety that you're getting comparable environments or comparable data because she didn't write it down. She never said. Yeah. But we do apply her theory so broadly and it's accepted so wholeheartedly that it's still worth challenging. And although you can't replicate the study because we don't know what she did, we can still test the propositions. And it would be really interesting to do that in communities. So we can't really use the communities that she worked with. So they, you can use prisons because they haven't changed much since she was working, but retirement villages and um, you know, manual laborers uh, would be difficult because their environments will have changed significantly. But something like the Amish would be really interesting. Um, and extremists as well, because of that whole insider outsider element of the small world. It would be very interesting. I, I agree. So, uh, Philip, I'll just uh, hit you up for some money and you can send me off to the Amish. Did you not get any prize money, Jane? <laughs> not enough. <laughs> <laughs> they live very cheaply, I believe, the Amish. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I had a comment. I, I don't know if you saw, Jane, I put in the chat. Uh, it's a few posts ago now. I was just perusing that Chapman paper. And after she introduces the propositions, there's quite an interesting paragraph, which I find slightly hard to parse, but it includes the section that I put in the chat. That Interestingly, I, I wonder if there's a typo, right? Which right at the very end, it says intended for everyday causal use. But I wonder if that seems more likely that she meant casual use i don't know because <laughs> yeah. they both they both they have slight quite different meanings but anyway um it, it occurs to me that it could like one interpretation of that is she's basically saying this theory is really applying to information directly about the small worlds right that it's that it, uh, one reading of that, and it's not entirely clear to me, but she's also she's all, all, almost kind of discounting casual, everyday information needs, which I I guess she may argue some of the needs for which people are going outside. Like, I mean, it's hard to do really, but yeah, I suppose you could construct an argument that that kind of keeping in touch with the news or so is, is a kind of you could you could classify as a kind of casual information need rather than an information need of di directly about the world in which you inhabit. If you were to limit the scope of the theory to information about the world in which you inhabit, might it be the case that there's that you might be able to 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 maintain some of those propositions that you discount? So that would be then information about prison life, really, wouldn't it? Yeah, I or guess Or your so. own legal matters. But I guess and... it's also a kind of information about, more sort of nebulous information about the 
you know the the the, the hierarchies within that social community and mm. what the current trading rate is for cigarettes or whatever do you know what I mean like so I guess mm. that kind of more uh highly centered information yeah that I think I could test that a little bit with the data I had because one of the areas of information I looked at was prison life and even for that there were still people were looking outside prison mm. to try and meet those needs about about life in prison so I think it would probably strengthen her theory if you limited the small world to that of the prison rather than the broader world that the prisoner lives in. But even if you did that, I still think there's evidence to suggest that people would be still looking outside their small world to help them live within their small world. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Because there's, yeah, that don't put another, it is kind of, it, it's not made clear. And in fact, I was sort of searching through the paper a little bit, hoping to find some clearer definitions of some of this stuff. Because as others have pointed out, like the Nate, you know, critical is a critical term in that terms of that proposition, but what's critical to people can vary and, and so on. So, yeah, there's, there is just this sense that, that you know, like that, that last quote about it, about that community in time and space. And if mm. she's only considering information directly relevant to that community in time and space, it kind of discounts the, that other information that, that sort of disproves the wide, the broader, more broadly yeah. applied theory. Yeah, you could look at it that way. And you know, one of the difficulties with that particular article where she talks about that theory is that she never actually comes back to a prison data in her writing beyond that um, in relation to information behavior. She talks about um, sort of like archetypes of types of people, but she doesn't then go back to the information element of it. Um, but yeah, that, that article where she does write about it, it's full of inconsistencies and it's full of strange language that, um, or like ideas that she almost picks up, but then drops before she develops them. And because she died uh, quite young, she didn't have a chance to sort of come back and build her theories or to test them herself or to challenge them. So yeah, it would be great to sit her down and say, what were you thinking when you put this together and where were you going with it? But um, it's not something we've been able to do. Because there's an argument made in that, you know, she gives examples in the paper of people, you know, which she sort of generalizes quite a lot, which is, you know, people don't like keeping up with news about their family because it makes them feel isolated from them. But it's not hard to imagine that you've encountered lots of prisoners who are desperate to keep in touch with yes. their family on the outside. And I would imagine really hang on to that as a sustaining force rather than something to be avoided. So, yeah, yeah. I can see. Your yeah. You see both. So prisoners will also say, I can't. I can't go there in my head because it hurts too much. But then you also uh, talk to people, particularly women, who say, I, I'm, a, I'm still alive because my children are out there and that's the only reason I'm still here. And they would go, like, one of them was telling me this beautiful story where she was given a tablet device and the tablets allow them to make phone calls outside rather than having to queue up for the wall phone. And uh, they were allowed to keep the tablets until 10 o'clock at night and then they're taken away from them and she says like now what I can do I ring my son he's three years old and I can read him a bedtime story and it's just beautiful that she said you know, it's for the first time I've been able to do that because I got given the tablets last week and uh, now we we'd, we share a bedtime story every night so lovely lovely stories about how important it is to stay connected with the outside world as well um, you you know uh, the the reason is, well, I have a comment about that, you know, the, uh, the reason is that the way we engage with our uh, target group and the way they identify themselves affect our, on our findings. i give you an example. I, I, I think that Chatman, uh, the way that she engaged with them, focused on them as prisoners. You know, that was the dominant perspective of them as a person. But the question that you asked them, specifically the question that you asked, what on earth you want to know as a person, not a prisoner. So my comment here is basically the way we do the research is very important on how we find the result. 
you know so the perspective of the researcher and the paradigm so i just focus uh, highlight the significance of the paradigm so the perspective of the researcher the perspective of the uh, interviewees and the paradigm these elements change everything so i think that you engage with them from a different paradigm different perspective and she engaged them with a different paradigm and perspective and that's why you can see these you know uh, totally different outcome so yeah mm. yeah i guess it's inevitably true isn't it we all come at the world that we see from our own perspective but yeah. even when you try really hard to suspend all your you know sense of um your ideas about the people you're with you can't exactly you can't really turn that off yeah yeah so because when you ask that person what you really want to know now it doesn't matter he's a prisoner or a person outside of the prison it's just as a person what do you want to know so then he had an idea uh, totally out of that prison so he talks about his dreams or you know whatever was in his mind Mm, that's right and jay jay's made an important point there so important distinction that uh indigenous prisoners let's just scroll off my screen but um would be very distinct from yes. the collective norms for prison yeah absolutely and jay i interviewed um i didn't specifically set out to interview any particular culture or other um i interviewed one man who identified as indigenous and i think he is um the, the saddest person i've ever spoken to in my whole life really he was just so sad and it was awful really being with him and not being able to help him um, and i'm sure that uh, as a white woman coming in asking an indigenous man uh, about his life would definitely be uh, a different experience and different interaction than me speaking to another white woman or even just like a free person talking to a prisoner there is just there are the intersections of our lives were so small that i will always be an outsider when i go into these places and as much as they speak freely and openly to me and are happy to have their stories told i'm always going to be the other and in the relationship so yeah you're quite right Any other quote? Oh, we've got a minute left. I should probably wrap things up unless there are any uh, final quick questions for Jay. Well, for Jane, sorry. Or Jay. <laughs> oh, Jay, just reading Jay, adding something to the chat. All right. Well, look, thanks so much, uh, Jane. I'll stop recording.